it's my honor to introduce a trustee of Monmouth College, Tony Persigian. Well, thank you, Steve, for that overly generous uh, introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, but what I appreciate more really is this uh, experience that uh, I'm sharing this weekend with my classmates from uh, the class of 66. Uh, so far, this has been an incredible experience, and I really feel sorry for our classmates who opted not to join us uh, for this weekend. As uh, Steve noted, uh, I retired from the University of Cincinnati after 40 years in September of 2010. And my wife, uh, Don, and I did not have any particular plans for my retirement other than to just enjoy ourselves and, and travel. Uh, just before my retirement, though, um, something just uh, dropped out of the sky. I got contacted by a former professor, a former pharmacy professor from the University of Cincinnati, an Egyptian, who uh, asked if I might be interested in... Uh, assisting a new private university get its legs in Egypt. Since about 1995, uh, private universities have been springing up in the Middle East, especially in Egypt, to really compensate for the horrible conditions of the governmental universities. Well, after a little bit of investigation, um, with no particular plans restraining us, uh, my wife and I said, why not? So. Uh, 1,995 days ago, uh, on December 15th, uh, 2010, uh, we arrived uh, in Cairo to start uh, what turned out to be an amazing experience, living four years uh, in Egypt, never imagining that uh, we'd have ringside seats to two revolutions. Uh, four years living there, we've continued our association, and. Um, the university, as mentioned, is the future university in Egypt. Uh, arriving again on December 15, 2010, uh, we discovered that uh, our housing was not ready, but uh, the future university, always generous with us, decided to entertain us for a couple weeks, never shabby to stay in an intercontinental, <laughs> and uh, shuffling between an intercontinental experience and uh, why not? And, sightseeing in Cairo, and why not uh, a cruise uh, from Luxor to uh, Aswan. So the focus of this uh, presentation is uh, not the travelogue, uh, antiquities kind of thing, but uh, yeah, dutifully, within 12 hours, we're doing what you're supposed to do when you arrive in Cairo. And I do want to make a plug. If you've got any slots open on your bucket list, really put Egypt on there. It is safe. Take it from me. Uh, you really have to see those pyramids. You really have to see Luxor Temple and go down to Abu Simbel, etc., etc., etc. But at any rate, um, Don and I, uh, the next morning after our arrival, completely uh, jet lagged, uh, our guide at the pyramids uh, inquired about our, our country of affiliation, and then surprisingly, we learned that our camel's name was Mickey. Uh, they try to make you feel at home. So, uh, I, those of you who've been to uh, the Giza pyramids, I'm sure you've seen this obligatory uh, photo op. There's my uh, uh, wife, Donna. And there we are in the shadow of the uh, Sphinx. And after doing the Cairo sightseeing, uh, again, our apartment's not ready. So, they flew us down to uh, Luxor, and I'm sure those of you who've been there, uh, recognize the famous obelisk at uh, Luxor uh, Temple. Spent a few days there, and then we sailed down to Aswan, and uh, that's an amazing experience. And uh, if you ever go to Aswan, uh, do take the optional three-hour drive down to Abu Simbel. It's uh, truly an, an amazing uh, site for, uh, for antiquities. Uh, I'm going to refer back to my three-hour drive from Aswan to Abu Simbel in, in a moment, but uh, just remember that I uh, noted a three-hour three-hour drive. Uh, Don and I uh, arrived, um, obviously excited about the prospects of uh, immersion in another culture, but of course we felt a little bit of uh, trepidation. 
Uh, there's a lot of anti-American sentiment in the Middle East. Uh, need we list uh, all of the things like uh, Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib or drone attacks or how about invading Iraq? Uh, so a lot of anti-American sentiment, understandably, uh, in the Middle East. And we felt a little self-conscious about that, uh, obviously. Uh, but I want to just underscore right now, if I forget later, uh, we could not possibly have been treated more hospitably or warmly or, or more generously. And so any anti-American sentiment, believe me, in a place like Egypt is directed to our government, not to us uh, <clears throat> as a people. They kept that completely uh, separate. And I think respect for America is underscored by the fact that uh, they're going to considerable effort and expense to bring me in there and put me up and house me and drive me around and uh, pay me, uh, again, with aspirations of uh, uh, educational academic uh, improvement. Most of my um, talk in the first half is going to be focused on the political events that you watched on uh, CNN, uh, the first revolution and the second uh, revolution. And then the last half of the talk is going to focus more on our personal circumstances of uh, living and working in Egypt. But just a little quick context, uh, I have to make this academic, right? Uh, just a quick little uh, context. Upon our arrival, uh, Egypt uh, was mired in 60 years of uh, military uh, dictatorships, uh, Nasser's coup in 52, uh, he was succeeded by Sadat, and Sadat was uh, gunned down and succeeded uh, by Mubarak. So, a succession of military dictatorships. Uh, we were now living in the most populous country uh, in the Middle East, 90 million people in uh, Egypt. Uh, you have to see Cairo to believe it. 20 million people, uh, predominantly Muslim country, obviously. 90% uh, uh, Sunni, we all have on our vocabularies now, Shia and Sunni, and Egypt is predominantly Sunni country. Uh, sizable uh, Christian population, 10% uh, Coptic. And if you really want some um, demographic trivia, there are today in Egypt 14 Jews. It used to be a very large population, but for many and obvious reasons that has uh, dissipated uh, over the years. While there might be 14 Jews, there are at least uh, five or 6,000 uh, Armenians still living in the vicinity of Cairo. And like most uh, developing nations, uh, there's a big demographic bul bulge of youth, 50% of the people living on uh, less than uh, $2 a day, rampant uh, unemployment. Um, all the seeds of discontent that uh, you might expect in a, in a developing um, in a developing nation. Uh, quick satellite view, uh, you can see that 90% of the people live on 10% of the land. Most people are clustered around uh, the Nile. And uh, here's a good landscape view of uh, Cairo, again, one of the most densely populated places uh, in the world, but uh, drab, uh, run down, uh, sort of just a metaphor for uh, a corrupt, uh, dysfunctional uh, regime over the, the previous um, uh, six uh, decades. And again, um, uh, that gives you, I think, a good sense of the, the general circumstances that um, we were facing. So finally, after a couple of weeks of uh, all the jolly time with uh, the sightseeing and the cruise and all that uh, good stuff, finally our the apartment was ready on January 1, uh, 2011, and uh, we were beginning to hear then in early January about uh, a certain date upcoming, a certain holiday, uh, namely Police Day. Uh, annually, uh, there's this uh, day off, national holiday, to celebrate the security forces. And um, how ironic that the um, rise of the people against oppression and dictatorship was kicked off on the day to be honoring the repressive uh, security uh, forces. Um, so we, we were feeling this buildup leading to 25 uh, January. Thinking back now on our 
drive a couple weeks earlier from Aswan down to Abu Simbel. We were in this car with a driver and a guide for about three hours, and I like to pick their brains and, and uh, see get the lay of the land, so to speak. And um, I was just dumbfounded by how candid this guide was about his country. I asked an innocent question. Oh, I thought you had elections last month, in November of 2010. And boy, that just unleashed him. <laughs> oh yeah, they were completely rigged. And oh, by the way, uh, the president uh, treats us like children. Uh, and, and we were just really struck by uh, raw nerves uh, that um, were expressed uh, uh, by this guy. Uh, and really, the sentiment we were hearing from this guy sort of represented the undercurrents of 90 million people who had been living under a brutal police state uh, for uh, 60 years uh, or so. And uh, my worst attempt at humor is to say right now that the straw that broke the Egyptian camel's back, <laughs> I rehearsed that, uh, but the straw that really broke the camel's back was the rumors that the president's son, Gamal Mubarak, was being groomed to succeed his father. And regardless of your political philosophy or of your political persuasion, that truly offended the sensibilities of the Egyptian people. And that really got the people all fired up, like, we ain't taking this anymore. We've had Danny Mubarak for 30 years. The last thing we need is his son to come in uh, come in as uh, president. So, you were watching CNN. Uh, the whole world was caught up with uh, Tahir Square. And to the extent that uh, there are oppressed people living under dictatorships around the world, there are a lot of people in the world rooting for the Egyptians who are gathering in Tahir Square to bring down to bring down their, uh, their leader. Uh, amazing uh, display, uh, uh, outpouring, driven, I might want to add, by tech-savvy youth who are using Facebook and using Twitter and uh, using all re technology resources uh, to get out the troops. And um, needless to say, uh, uh, fear was erased from the sentiments and uh, the feelings of the Egyptian people. Uh, so, not to exaggerate, but uh, 90 million people did awaken during those 18 days. The myth of state omnipotence was shattered. And for 18 days, whether you were a Christian or a Muslim, young, old, rich, or poor, you were chanting bread, freedom, and social justice. That became the mantra of the, of the revolution. And what we were basically witnessing was the eruption of anger and rage of people living under 60 years of, um, of tyranny. Uh, we had a lot of frustration. I'm going to just fast forward for a second to give you another little microcosmic view of the pulse and the culture there. About a month, two months later, I was having uh, coffee near the campus, and an engineering student spotted me. And uh, he knew I was in some prominent position at the university, and so, oh, I'm going to pounce on this guy and really give him an earful. So he gave me an earful about how lousy the engineering program is and how bad the professors are. And so he was just letting it all hang out with me so I could go fix it. Uh, but after he trashed the engineering program in the university, he then started to lament that, uh, you know, what's in, what's in this life for me? I'm going to graduate, probably. I'm not going to be able to get a good job, even though I'm an engineer. And you know, Dr. Tony, that they use the first names there. You know, Dr. Tony, I'm never going to be able to leave home. I'm never going to be able to get married. I'm never going to have a family. And wow, I mean, that's, that's poignant uh, stuff. And uh, just multiply that across the 
hundreds of thousands of people who are on, on Tahir Square seeing a future bleak and realizing that there was a, like here, a 1% that's um, running and uh, unfairly uh, having the most just desserts uh, in, that, uh, in that country. Don and I uh, lived east of town at, uh, in a, actually it's called New Cairo, and we didn't go down to Tahir Square, and we basically experienced the revolution like you did watching CNN, albeit we watched it on Al Jazeera. And uh, I just want to share one uh, personal, a couple observations of what Don and I were seeing and, and doing. Every night, it was very fascinating. We'd look out from our balcony, and we'd watch uh, neighborhood patrols. Uh, guys from the neighborhood would get together, get a band bonfire going, and putting up uh, checkpoints throughout uh, the neighborhood. Because by now, the security forces had been removed uh, from service, Mubarak had let all the criminals uh, out of jail. Uh, there was uh, rampant crime going on, a lot of looting going on, and um, so people had to take uh, security into their own hands. So that was kind of interesting to watch our, our little neighborhood rising up and uh, patrolling and protecting uh, ourselves. About halfway through the revolution, uh, Don and I were getting a little low on chow, so uh, we had an interesting experience uh, going to the market, and uh, it was about two-thirds of the way through the revolution, and we go to this market, and it was utter bedlam. Yeah, talk about panic buying. So we go into this very raucous melee in this grocery store, and you could see people all stressed out. You could see the shelves becoming rapidly uh, depleted. Uh, so we decided on a division of labor. I would stand in line with the empty cart, and Donna would try to find some crackers and tuna fish, uh, whatever. So she left me in this two-hour line to get to the cash register, and I heard, overheard two women speaking, and they were speaking in English, so I really perked up. And uh, one said to the other, oh, did you hear that Israeli tanks have crossed the border and are now going across the Sinai Peninsula, and they will be here soon. There's no reason to believe that, by the way, but I, I don't know why that comment just flipped a physiological switch on me, because the next moment I realized, oh my God, you are having a heart attack in this grocery store, great timing tone. <laughs> and I've never had that kind of a reaction before. Uh, cold sweats, uh, numbness, dizziness. You know, I'm trying to prop myself up with this empty grocery cart, and I'm like, what the hell? I can't believe this is happening to me at this point. Um, Don arrived shortly thereafter and escorted me to get someplace a little fresh air, and she would man the grocery carts. But, I'm no MD, but I think I had, and I'm not embarrassed to admit, I think I had a panic attack. <laughs> so that was my revolutionary experience, um, one that I've never had, had before, and uh, I hope I never have, uh, and I never have again. Uh, toward the end of the revolution, uh, the university closed, and uh, the State Department was urging us to get out of Dodge. and. Uh, our government, always service first, uh, uh, gave us instructions, if you can get to the airport, uh, the big if, bring uh, water and toiletries uh, for uh, at least uh, three days. We'll fly you one way to Athens or Istanbul, and you will reimburse us. So that didn't sound like a real good deal. So we actually did evacuate on Lufthansa as a good alternative to what the State Department did. Uh, was was offering. So we did go back to Cincinnati for, for a month and then um, returned in um, March, of, uh, March of 2011. But truly amazing when we got back, um, a gentleman uh, from the travel agency picked us up. Now remember this is a month after Mubarak had stepped down 
and the giddiness, the euphoria that the travel agent was, was feeling was, was, was quite remarkable. He, he told me how he had taken his four-year-old daughter down to the square to sweep it up. And he told me this is the first time I ever felt proud to be an Egyptian. What a declaration. And the sweetest observation, though, you get a kick out of this. He said, Dr. Tony, someday we're going to be like America. And I said, what do you mean by that, Dr. Of course, his name is Muhammad. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you mean by that, Dr. Muhammad? And he said, uh, well, when I watch TV and I see the policeman catch the bad guy, they gently handcuff him, and then they take him to the car, and they always hold his head as they put him into the back seat. Now, how many times, how many times have you seen that on TV, <laughs> or even experienced it? That is, <laughs> but, but anyway, but isn't that interesting? That that what, what he would like to see Egypt become, where citizens are treated with respect, even though even if they're uh, even if they're um, uh, criminals. Just a few slides from um, the revolution. This is from Tahir Square. And when it's Friday at noon, of course, all revolutions have to stop for Friday prayers. And uh, please note that the tank is right on Tahir Square. A guy is freely putting graffiti on the tank at Tahir Square. All this in the shadows, of course, of the Ritz Carlton. Uh, but this is an important point to note that as the revolution unfolded, the military basically stood down and let the revolutionaries um, um, play, out, uh, play out the revolution. Um, this is a, a shot from um, the famous Egyptian museum, and I want you to note the building that's uh, burning next to it. That's the headquarters of Mubarak's uh, political party, the National Democratic Party. And uh, here you can see the grounds of the Egyptian Museum and the uh, burned out shell of the NDP building. Really symbolic that the root of all corruption and oppression, the National Democratic Party, that the protesters actually assaulted that building and, and burned it to a shell. Many of us feared that the, that the museum itself uh, would be compromised as, as, uh, as, uh, as close as it was. Uh, some of you may remember um, hearing about the famous uh, Battle of the Camel. About halfway through the revolution, Mubarak and his um, wealthy supporters hired thugs who took the camels from the Giza pyramids and these thugs rode into Tahir Square with machetes and, and clubs, bayonets, attacking the protesters. Uh, after a six-hour pitched battle with the Battle of the Camel, uh, at least 100 of the protesters uh, were killed. And, uh, and uh, this become uh, sort of one of those good examples of, uh, I think, a, a, a struggling, flailing, and uh, about to be toppled um, administration. Uh, please note it, that uh, the, the authorities were trying to block the, uh, the revolution initially, and uh, very poignantly, if you look closely, you can see that the tear gas canister reads, made in the USA. Uh, be reminded now that uh, we've been providing Egypt 1.2 billion years, billion dollars of aid uh, annually, and 95 percent of that 1.2 billion dollars goes to military uh, armaments. And there's a lot, at this time, a lot of people on the Egyptian street would feel that, uh, well, um, America is supporting the dictator, or America is supporting the tyrant. And this guy holds a sign up on Tahrir Square: "America, support the people, uh, not the tyrant." Well, in the initial days of the revolution, uh, we were supporting the tyrant. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden said very positive things publicly about the leadership of Hosni Mubarak. He's our ally. He's our supporter. He's, he's, he's our guy. 
And this just essentially reinforced and further empowered uh, the protesters enough for that one guy to uh, hold up a sign. But when it looked clear that Mubarak was going down the tubes, uh, Obama did in fact uh, call Mubarak <coughs> And I think the decision to throw Mubarak under the bus was after the front wheels were already over, over Mubarak. Uh, but he did, in fact, uh, uh, obviously step down. And um, Mubarak's, uh, uh, I think, reaction to uh, Obama w was fitting here. And by the way, there are lingering issues uh, with that. To this day, uh, our other friends, quote friends, quote allies, are still very suspicious of us. Uh, the, the Saudis uh, did not like the fact that we abandoned Mubarak. The Gulf state monarchies did not like the fact that we abandoned Mubarak because they sure as hell did not want democracy to be spreading from Egypt to, to their uh, countries. And so a lot of <coughs> lingering resentment uh, on that score as, as we speak. And. Uh, and of course, during this time, there are always the conspiracy theories, always the hidden hand that's causing this to happen. And of course, uh, to this day, many counter-revolutionary people would argue that this was a plot by the CIA. Uh, the CIA, is, it's, its powers are exaggerated in my view, but it's just part of the mentality, the conspiracy theory mentality that is so uh, uh, pervasive. But at any rate, uh, this took only 18 days, uh, and the 30-year dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak ended, and um, SCAF comes to power, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. And remember, as I noted a little while ago, that the uh, about halfway through the revolution, the military stood down, the security forces the uh, secret police, they disappeared and let it, all, uh, let it all play out. So for at least a month or two, there was still a lot of popular sentiment about the army. At least they didn't try to stop us. And I remember that next month, uh, our son and daughter-in-law visited and we took him down to the museum. We were about the only people at the museum by now with tourism completely collapsing. But as we arrived, we saw a lot of people still, a month later, cheering the military for at least letting the revolution, uh, revolution play out. But as 2011 um, unfolded, uh, things started to deteriorate in the, in the country. And many people were becoming impatient. When SCAF came into power, they said, trust us, uh, there will be parliamentary elections, there will be a new constitution, and after that we'll have presidential elections and uh, we're good to go. And, 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 the, and really what the dog whisper was, that there would be a civilian government uh, in place. But by the end of 2011, uh, the revolutionaries were getting more and more impatient, like when are these elections going to occur? Um, when are we going to see civilian rule? And by the end of um, uh, the year, calendar year 2011, protests uh, started up again, and now the security forces are out on the streets, and they are, thank you, playing hardball. Mohammed Mahmoud Street is one of the main feeder streets into uh, Tahir Square, and you can see the youth out protesting in, in November. A good iconic sense of uh, the circumstances of the country captured here, and maybe some of you have seen this uh, picture before, the, the woman in the blue bra. Uh, she was uh, one of the protesters at Mohammed Mahmoud Street. <laughs> And uh, needless to say, the security forces were playing uh, hardball with her. Uh, they had uh, stripped away her clothing, uh, and you can see the blue bra, and she was uh, stomped pretty seriously uh, in that situation. The excuse was that she wasn't properly clothed and um, she was not modest enough, but in fact, she had plenty of clothing on. It had been stripped away by the, uh, by the security 
uh, by the security forces. The, um, the Blue Bra incident then um, kind of a good e example of um, some of the oppressive techniques that were being practiced. But probably most oppressive was how many women from Mohammed Mahmoud Street and from Tahir Square at the end of calendar year 2011 were escorted to the Egyptian Museum where the military performed virginity tests. The virginity tests were led by General Abdul Fattah Sisi, who eventually became the president of, uh, of Egypt. And you ask, well, why are they taking the ladies over to the museum for virginity tests? Well, the defense that was made was that unless we perform these tests, how are we going to protect the army from allegations of rape? And that was the justification, uh, justification for that. As we get now into, as we get now into um, 2012, uh, Don and I were taking a holiday, and uh, you get a chance, you you have to see Dubai to believe it. But anyway, it's like. Um, Las Vegas on steroids, but with um, no dancers. But at any rate, um, <laughs> we were in Dubai, and we had the TV on, and we couldn't believe what was on, on the television. Uh, this is a picture of this soccer stadium at Port Said. And what had occurred was that the super prominent team from Cairo <coughs> was playing a soccer game in Port Said. They were, it was a road game. And they were represented at this game by their really uh, dogged fans, the so-called ultras, who played a prominent role on the square during the revolution. And so the ultras, they always follow their team, just like Cub fans go to Cincinnati, really annoys me, but uh, the same thing, <laughs> all the fans uh, go to uh, we're in Port Said for that game. Long and the short of it, the Cairo team lost, which was remarkable in itself, but after the game, the security forces locked the stadium down, shut the lights off, barred the doors, and provoked uh, a horrible stampede. This is their payback time, and 72 of those Cairo soccer fans were trampled to death, or stabbed, or suffocated, or thrown off the top of the stadium. This was the security forces way to say, this is payback time. You got your way at the square, Mubarak stepped down, but you humiliated us and the security. This is payback time. And not much exaggeration uh, to that. So 72 people died, and to this day there's been little accountability of the security guards in, in, in charge and it's, let's say it's an opaque judiciary system um, in, in Egypt. So as we get into early uh, 2012, uh, SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, is following through and um, parliamentary elections did in fact uh, occur. And any polit political scientist with, with his or her stripe would have predicted that the Muslim Brotherhood would do well in these elections. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Muslim Brotherhood, this sort of uh, shadowy, secretive uh, organization that was founded in 1928 uh, with a real Islamist agenda, agenda, including to one day have a caliphate in the whole Middle East to bring back the glorious times of a thousand years before. And the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was itself repressed by the regimes, uh, but they did a lot of um, uh, uh, social work, they did a lot of uh, charity work, and they were a well-organized uh, entity. So, as it turns out, the Muslim Brotherhood, this Islamist group, won two-thirds of the seats in, in Parliament, uh, much to the chagrin of the liberals, much to the chagrin of the revolutionary youth, much to the chagrin of Christians, much to the chagrin of the revolutionary 
or evolutionary forces, but totally predictable because they were, they were really uh, organized. Uh, Don and I watched with interest during the campaign for those seats, and you'd see billboards and signs, and uh, just like any American campaign, with one exception. You'd see pictures of this guy and pictures of that guy, and then next to that, that guy was a picture of a flower, and then another guy and then a flower. So it was explained to us that the pictures of the flowers were representing the Islamist Salafi females who are running for parliament, and of course, you can't show their face, so they were represented uh, in the campaign literature and posters by a flower. Makes sense, uh, makes sense, I guess. But from February, from February to June of 2012, it truly was silly season, as you get this, these rank amateur Muslim Brotherhood members, no experience in politics, <coughs> now basically running parliament. And now they're really beginning to feel their oats for legislation for this and legislation for that. So how about lowering the age of girls allowed to be married to nine? Seriously, lower the marriage age of girls to nine. Let's weaken the laws against female genital mutilation. That, that works, because they've been toughened up a little bit, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, re, uh, restrict, uh, restrict those. And of course, the, the usual attacks on uh, restricting uh, alcohol consumption, uh, silly season around, um, let's, let's have separate beaches for men and women at the Red Sea resorts. Uh, can you imagine going on a Caribbean holiday and you and your spouse are on separate beaches? But anyway, that's, that, was, uh, that was proposed. And um, there, but many satirists started to react to this and they were trying to lampoon the Muslim Brotherhood parliamentarians. So a lot of rumors started to spread about proposed legislation. And one of the better rumors that was spread was that the Muslim Brotherhood is promoting legislation uh, around bereavement. And of course, since we have a male-dominated society, we need to assert that throughout the whole period. So the bereavement legislation would allow conjugal relations for up to three days after your wife passed away. Um, did you, hear, did you hear what I just said? <laughs> did that sink in? <laughs> okay. So it obviously it was getting to be legislatively silly, silly season. And by June of 2012, um, the military probably said, well, okay, they've had their fun. And the judiciary, which is still entrenched from the old regime, all these old judges from the Mubarak time, who were certainly not Islamists, uh, they decided, well, enough of this nonsense. Um, so the, the judiciary uh, decided that the parliamentary elections were flawed and they dissolved, uh, di dissolved, the, um, dissolved the parliament. But the presidential elections uh, did play out. Okay. And uh, in spring of 2012, and this is interesting, Don and I were so happy when 13 people stepped forward to run for president. And there were some cool people. Uh, there was a Christian or two. There were some liberals. There were some secularists. And the Muslim Brotherhood did break its promise saying they wouldn't run anybody for president. Well, in fact, they did run somebody for president. But 13 people ran and had the, had the election. And just what we observed in the Republican primaries played out here. It was kind of a di divide and conquer situation. Uh, recall Trump never had a majority of the votes. He had a plurality of votes until one person dropped off, next person dropped off, and so forth and so on. So the 13 were winnowed down to, to two, Mohammed Morsi and Ahmed Shafiq, pitting the Muslim Brotherhood against the old guard, a guy who'd been prime minister, a guy who'd been a general, quintessentially Mubarak, basically, and the old 
the old regime manifested uh, in him. Morsi, interestingly enough, uh, engineering professor, uh, pretty high up in the Muslim Brotherhood uh, hierarchy, PhD in engineering from the University of Southern California. I'm not sure what rubbed off during that uh, PhD, but um, I wasn't planning to say this, but, um, but I am reminded, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but um, a very interesting study has just come out looking at the profiles of the 9-11 hijackers and other jihadis uh, from Europe and elsewhere. And I have to tell you, these are educated people. And strangely enough, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'll huge percentage of these people flying into the Twin Towers have degrees in engineering. So um, I, don't know what, I don't know what to make of that. But at any rate, um, at any rate, there was a runoff election and uh, Muslim Brotherhood versus, uh, versus Old Guard. Now put yourself in a position of being a, a revolutionary. You sure as hell did not want to have the old guard back in charge in uh, Ahmed uh, Shafiq. But then again, sure, not an Islamist. And so a lot of people just held their nose and voted for Morsi. And he got 51.7% of the vote. Wow. And what a culmination. This shadow secretive group in existence for 80 years, repressed, suppressed, suddenly came into power, not only in that parliamentary election, but their guy is now president. I mean, this is just earth-shaking uh, for, for Egypt in a very negative, negative kind of way because uh, uh, the Islamist agenda is not the, the, the Egyptian agenda. But um, uh, the, the sad irony here is that finally, after 5,000 years, Egypt had really fair, free elections. And the good people of Egypt, and this was the joke, they had to choose between cholera and smallpox. <laughs> and, and, now, I'm not going to say that's true in the United States today, but we do, we do, have, we do have two unpopular people. And that's what exactly happened. By the way, the Muslim Brotherhood announced the election results before the government did, declaring victory. Uh, who knows what the actual vote was, because everything is pretty opaque in Egypt. But um, I think fearing a bloodbath, which was threatened by the, Islam Brother, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the, the government did agree and, um, and declared uh, Mohammed Morsi um, the winner. So now we're um, in the last half of uh, 2012 and into 2013, now having this Muslim Brotherhood uh, president, uh, Mohammed Morsi. The generals did dutifully go back uh, to, their, um, to their barracks, but uh, in some way you have to kind of feel sorry for Morsi because uh, he did have the deck stacked against him because you, you do have a judiciary, you do have a bureaucracy, which is still entrenched from the good old days. The, the corrupt, moneyed business elite are still basically running the show. And of course, all the judges are in their back pocket uh, as well. So with a dissolved parliament, no legislative body, Morsi saw an opportunity to really get power. So uh, literally on Thanksgiving day of uh, 2012, Don and I were at a restaurant and enjoying our lamb, and uh, we looked around, and everybody else in the restaurant stopped eating, was glued to the tube. And we didn't understand the Arabic, but we did learn later that uh, a spokesman for the president was announcing a constitutional decree, and that President Morsi is now above the judiciary. He's above the laws. He's above, above the courts. So that really infuriated the, infuriated the people, um, uh, to say the least. And um, that started then um, a new wave of uh, anti-administration um, 
uh, demonstrations. Uh, but clearly, the Muslim Brotherhood, under uh, with Mohammed Morsi leading the charge, they were certainly trying to impose an Islamist agenda. They rammed through a constitution, a new constitution, in December of 2012, with all kinds of references to Sharia law, which people were not accustomed uh, accustomed to that. And so, by the end of 2012. Uh, people were um, people were taking to the streets and essentially offended by Morsi's actions. I mean, he just did all these bonehead things. And he said, I'm going to be the president of all the Egyptians. So what does he do? He puts uh, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood in charge of the cultural ministry. He tried to ban the ballet. They... They responded by coming out in the streets and dancing in front of the cultural ministry, just to, like, in your face, Mohammed, this is, you're not going to ruin the ballet. And one of the most outrageous things he did, they made, governors are not elected in Egypt, they're appointed. And so Morsi appoints the new governor of Luxor, one of the meccas of tourism in the world. So who does he name the governor of Luxor? But a guy who's a member of the organization that massacred the 97 tourists there, in uh, the 60 tourists in uh, in 1997. So, just kind of bonehead move after uh, bonehead move. Um, <laughs> under uh, Morsi's rule, conditions started to uh, deteriorate some. Uh, now, the fuel is still cheap, but uh, the lines at the pump yeah, were, re and it was amusing to me, every time um, I would uh, be with my driver, and we'd drive by one of these scenes, he'd always point and say, Morsi, Morsi, like it was President Morsi's fault that uh, conditions uh, were like that. Uh, that year, under Morsi, uh, we saw more and more expressions of um, public piety. Uh, Don and I took this picture from uh, our balcony, and these are people living below us. Uh, become, when we first arrived, there were very few females in for full niqab, full face covering, but under the Islamist agendas, that changed a lot. And we were always struck by, when going to the pool, that the dad and the kids could enjoy the swim and wear what you'd wear at the pool and so forth, but uh, mom, of course, uh, did not have that, um, have that right. Uh, this just basically shows how tourism uh, had tanked uh, even more so under Morsi. There's my son and my spouse, and you can see that they're basically alone at the, at the Giza pyramids. One particularly bad incident under Morsi's rule, the security forces all disappeared. There was an assault on uh, on our embassy, and um, on that occasion, um, who knows what's going to happen, but um, Obama did call uh, Morsi and said, you got to bring an end to this, and famously uttered the words that uh, Egypt is not an ally or an enemy, and I thought I was very, very struck uh, by those declarations. <coughs> So, uh, as 2013 unfolded and more and more people are becoming disaffected uh, with the government, uh, we started to hear about another date. Just like 25 January was popularly uttered, now we're beginning to hear another date, 30 June. And this was a date that was part of a petition <laughs> drive, again by tech savvy youth, in spring of 2013, circulating a petition to call for early elections. And um, the goal was to get 13 million signatures, because that's how many votes Morsi got to be president. It's estimated they got 22 million signatures, signing the petition for early elections on 30 January, the one year anniversary of, uh, of, uh, of Morsi's rule. So everything was going to come to a head then, somehow, some way, on, uh, on 30 June. Two days before that, the military issued an ultimatum to the president. 
like, hey, you got to get off the dime. The people are upset with you. Um, you need to listen. But Morsi dug in his heels. He talked about, I'm the legitimate president. And he was. Uh, and he was not about to throw in the towel, of course, after <clears throat> being repressed since 1928. So long story short, 30 January, uh, 30 June, it was rocking. There were more people on Tahir Square for that revolution than the one in, uh, in 2011. And again, it was uh, a, a, an outbreak of people of all walks of life, Christians and, uh, and Muslims, young and old, uh, rich and poor, everyone gathered to protest uh, the presidency. And it, it just amazing scene. More people on Tahir Square now than, um, than two years before. I mean, it was very festive with the laser lights every night. Uh, this is a good friend of uh, uh, Donna's from, from her school, uh, showing just the euphoria that we're getting our country back. Uh, now, we were not on the square. Don and I were out in the burbs. And, um, uh, but even out there, there was polite protests going on, and you can see the marchers in our neighborhood. But again, um, the same kind of fervor and, and patriotism, and this time directed against the, um, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood uh, president. So on my birthday in uh, 2013, uh, Morsi was uh, taken to a safe house. Well, you we know. <laughs> How that ended up. He ended up in a cage and he ended up in jail. So America never called it a coup in deference to the sensibilities of the Egyptian people. Now, it was a coup. Uh, but the Egyptian people would say, not really, because there were 20 million people out and the military was simply doing our bidding. So I don't know how you want to split the difference, but. Um, uh, he was removed from office. And that sparked then counter demonstrations and protests. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamist super, uh, sympathizers now huddled east of downtown at near a mosque called Rabah al Adawaya. I know a little bit of Arabic. Uh, but at any rate, uh, thousands of people massed there uh, from July 3rd to August 14th. And August 14th will live in infamy when uh, the military lost its patience and uh, went in and it was carnage. I remember getting an email from a close friend at um, FUE saying, Dr. Tony, Egyptians are killing Egyptians. And that's exactly what happened as, uh, as the revolution um, uh, really uh, came to a kind of a ugly conclusion with the dispersal of the Islamists at Rabah al adawiyya And ever since then, the Muslim Brotherhood has been labeled, legally and otherwise, a terrorist organization, and that's been the excuse for the per persecution and the mass incarceration. Well, they're, must, they're terrorists, so we have to lock them up uh, or kill them. But these were not all Muslim Brotherhood leaders who were massacred. Uh, a lot of... Um, um, Young people, a lot of children, a lot of uh, women were part of that uh, part of that uh, massacre. So um, we're going to switch, and I'll come back to the politics uh, shortly. But um, and I think my time may be moving quickly here. But uh, I did want to give you guys some uh, glimpses of our daily life uh, in Egypt, and I'll come back to the politics in, in a bit. As mentioned earlier, F you. Uh, I'm at the <laughs> Future University uh, in Egypt, uh, founded in uh, 2006. There are uh, six faculties, at, or we don't call them colleges there, we call them faculties. Six faculties with uh, engineering, uh, business, uh, pharmacy, dentistry, computer science, and then one that would come close to us here, a faculty of political science, and, uh, and economics. Uh, so I was in the administration building. Uh, you can see a little bit of the, of the campus. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous facility. I'm proud to say that when I arrived in 2010, 
we had just over 3,000 students, and now we have over 7,000 students. And think about that, despite all of the revolutions and all the economic travails and a collapsing economy, there are still people who can afford a private education and will send little Marwa or little Ahmed for a private education, and, and we've more than uh, doubled our enrollment. Uh, made unbelievable uh, friends, uh, uh, friends from the uh, International Affairs Office. Uh, the person standing, <laughs> sitting next to Donna was going to be going to Qatar, where her husband had a hotel job, and we were out uh, celebrating. And uh, here they're celebrating uh, my birthday. Any, any opportunity for sweets, uh, they take. <coughs> Great office. Uh, and uh, while we were there, one of the additionally enriching aspects of that experience was that um, my wife, Donna, uh, took a position at the Modern American School in Egypt. Donna, did you want to say just a word? Quick? Okay, I was bored at some point, to be perfectly frank, and we might not have been there for four years if I hadn't been able to find something to do. But the second year that we were there, I did get a job at the Modern American School in Egypt. Egypt likes what they call language schools. These are all private schools. They have French schools, German schools, British schools, and American schools. Although this was titled an American school, which it was, we had an American curriculum, uh, kids took the SAT when they graduate, K-12 school. I worked with curriculum. My job was to work with curriculum and teacher evaluation, things I've done here before. But the students are Egyptian. Uh, it's not a school for expats. Uh, they start in kindergarten. They have two years of kindergarten in all Egyptian schools. These are the four-year-olds at Christmas. So I want you to note that we have all these cute little Muslim four-year-olds <laughs> singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> they love Christmas. In fact, we had eight kindergarten classes, four in first year, one's in four second year. Each class marches up, sings their songs, and marches off. But this is a yearly event, and I think it's just a darling photo. That's the eighth graders. It's K-12 school, like I said. And of course, we can do every, all of our performances and everything outside because rain is very rare. So this is where they were doing the Wizard of Oz. Uh, we lived in New Cairo in a gated community, which was very safe and protected, about 60,000 um, people. And it made just like any US suburb with uh, soccer fields and swimming pools and big cars and overly indulged children and hormonally charged teenagers, but no alcohol, no bikinis, and uh, no women on the tennis courts except for Donna Perzigian. Though I had an advantage, she had to wear long pants on the tennis court, so um, I had a little bit of an advantage uh, there. But the people in Cincinnati did get a lot of jollies out of the fact that Donna and Tony traveled over 6,000 miles to go into rehab. <laughs> but at any rate, um, that's our apartment, uh, yeah, second floor apartment, uh, five balconies, <clears throat> how do you like that? A uh, couple, a little view of our uh, apartment, that's one half of the living room and there's the other half of the living room. We had more space than we knew what to do with. Uh, our son visited. Um, there was plenty of shopping and recreation and uh, rehab. We would go to the souk uh, four times uh, a week at least, walk, of course. And uh, Don and I probably walked more in those four years than we did the previous uh, 25 years. But everything from soup to nuts at, at the souk, including uh, a, a food court. You don't see it, but uh, there is KFC and uh, Pizza Hut and McDonald's. And uh, rest assured, America does have a secret weapon to bring down the rest of the world. And it's our fast food. <laughs> they, uh, it's sad to see, frankly, but that they, the KFC, the McDonald's, that kind of stuff, they gorge on it, and it's a delicacy, and um, it's just running up the count on diabetes, obesity, and heart disease, and uh, everything else. <laughs> we didn't go to those places. Instead, we would go get Iraqi bread from an Iraqi a refugee, kind of a fun, fun stop every t 
two or three days. And you can see the sheep and goats all lined up for the sacrifice for the Eid celebration. And I don't know how many times we saw somebody buy a, buy a goat and put the goat in the trunk of the car alive, you know, to <laughs> okay, but we knew the fate of the goat was, of course, going to be, it was going to be sacrificed. But with those celebrations, they do share at least half of the, of the carcass uh, with, with the poor. Now, Don, of course, is a close horse. And um, yes, Rahab had, Rahab had two malls. Mall one, and yes, literally, mall two. And uh, depending on uh, Donna's mood, she could shop here. Or she might want to go more conservative and uh, buy an Abaya. And typical street scene, uh, this is, it just blows us away every time we can see this. There's a woman very conservatively dressed, of course, wearing a hijab and window shopping. And of course, she's got to dress a certain way on the street, but boy, when she gets home, uh, <laughs> anything goes. Uh, Donna made a lot of great friends. Uh, these are the wise women of Rahab. They would get together every Wednesday for coffee. And uh, Donna could write a book about the stories of these women and about their Egyptian husbands. But uh, again, just uh, great friends. We had a nice pool. Uh, as I said, the, the, the university treated us so generously. I uh, uh, had a car and a driver. I felt like a rock star almost. And we got very close to our drivers. And um, uh, that driver that you just saw had uh, a new son born. We made uh, a trip to his house, and that was one of the most memorable experiences in Egypt, to actually go into an Egyptian home. And frankly, we broke all kinds of cultural taboos, since Don and I, you could say, were from the 1%, and nobody from the 1% would ever go into a driver's house or a gardener's house or anything like that. And this family was really touched by that fact, they bought new glassware for Tony and Donna coming. Uh, and there we are with uh, the new baby. I wish it was a baby with easier name, but yeah, yeah, was the baby's name. Uh, every weekend, our driver would take us maybe mall or something. One time, he said, oh, Ale, drop us off at the mall. Go bring your family, and we'll have fun together. And you can see the baby's a little bit uh, bigger now, but just... Uh, the greatest memories, uh, but always reminded that to get from point A to point B in Egypt is no, no easy matter, and that that streetscape is uh, so very common. And the juxtapositions that you see, you, you see right next to a donkey cart is um, a truck, of course, and they are very creative in terms of how much they can uh, get out of truck, and it's just a, a typical street scene. Another typical street scene. Uh, this one I point out, I was talking to Bill Carlson earlier who'd been to the Kanyo Kalili Market in Cairo, a teeming place normally with tourists, but ah, sadly, uh, the tourists have uh, disappeared. Uh, plenty of shops, but no tourists. Uh, I picked this picture out just because, uh, again, how the circumstances have really collapsed for, for the tourism. We're celebrating Donna's birthday at, uh, the, at, at a Marriott Hotel in the place in Cairo. In fact, this Marriott Hotel is in a former Turkish palace. And the point is not to brag that we were eating in, at the Marriott for Donna's birthday, but there's no one else, no one else in the restaurant. Now, uh, we've got two more slides to go, I think. Um, and back to the politics. Uh, we used this slide uh, about, I think, it maybe a year ago in a different presentation. And uh, uh, the slide read, well, the overthrow of Mubarak, well, that was easy. Step two, overthrow of Mor Morsi, a little more difficult, but we got it done. And the question mark at the time was, well, will Egypt be able to rein in the army and restart demographic, uh, democratic reforms? 
and we wanted to end the presentation on an upbeat note that one certainty is that genie's out of the bottle and Egyptians will fight for their rights. So where are we today? Well, the current circumstances, um, maybe the Arab Spring is the Arab Winter. I don't know um, if that's apt or not, but uh, the guy who was performing the virginity tests is now the president, and he won uh, the election with 96.91% of the vote. Last November, a pro-CC, pro-regime parliament was elected with many of the people from the old Mubarak time, all the, the cronies and the corrupt types were now get, slowly getting back into power. And sadly enough, thousands of Islamists are in jail, joined by hundreds and hundreds of journalists. It's really a tough time to be a journalist. And many, how sad, many of their first revolution revolutionaries are now locked up because they've been trying to protest, and now there are protest laws. Unless you get the permission of the interior security, you can't demonstrate anymore. So uh, hundreds and hundreds of people are now locked up. And um, in, a, in a nutshell, Mubarak era paternalism, economic exclusion, and political repression uh, certainly uh, prevail. Now I might add that um, uh, Morsi's Popularity is showing some signs of waning. The economy is not uh, improving. Uh, there have been some uh, mishaps. They're giving a couple islands away to Saudi Arabia. So people are beginning to lose patience with, uh, with President Sisi. Uh, but for now, uh, there's still this oh, adoration of him. Uh, and there's, of course, a tradition for having dictators and a certain obsequiousness on the part of the people, and uh, so, I don't know, maybe not appropriate for me to put on that slide, Father Knows Best, but you know, in a lot of ways that kind of captures the situation with uh, Cece, uh, Cece running the show. And so, just um, to leave on a, on a, on a note, um, it's been an interesting five years, and Don and I would say, may the dream of bread, freedom, and social justice come true someday uh, for the good people of Egypt. Thank you for coming. I uh, really enjoyed it.